I think the most important thing is number one, having a good idea of what tick species are are common to the region or the area that the pet is living and or visiting during the course of each year as a veterinarian is kind of reviewing what an appropriate parasite control plan is for, for that patient. Hey everybody, welcome back. This episode is sponsored by Elenco and features Dr. Katherine Reif, who I was so excited to get the chance to talk to. She is in just high demand right now after completing a really interesting study on ticks and the speed of kill after administration of some of our more common flea and tick medications. Of course, many of us are probably familiar with the 48 and 72 hour label claims, and we talk about where those label claims come from. But in her study, Dr. Reif dove in even more and tested these products at much more narrow intervals and illustrated the efficacy and speed of kill immediately after administration, as well as at the end of the dosing cycle. I'll be honest, ticks are one of my greatest fears, just kind of how sneaky and insidious they are and the widespread and variable nature of tick-borne diseases and they're not the easiest parasites to protect our pets and ourselves against. And of course we're finding that some of these tick-borne diseases can be transmitted pretty rapidly And that's where speed of kill and the variability among products becomes so important. So I'm gonna stop there and let Dr. Reif describe the rest of the study, which is really interesting. Although I will say it did not do anything to help my fear of ticks. So let me go ahead and introduce her and let's talk about it. Dr. Katherine Reif is an associate professor and the inaugural holder of the Bailey Goodwin Endowed Professorship in Parasitology in the Department of Pathobiology in the College of Veterinary Medicine at Auburn University. Dr. Reif's research interests broadly revolve around vectors and vector-borne diseases of veterinary, medical, and agricultural importance, with a primary focus on ticks and tick-borne pathogens of public health and veterinary concern. Some of Dr. Reif's ongoing research projects include developing new approaches for real-time monitoring of tick salivation and feeding behaviors, evaluating antimicrobial efficacy to control tick-borne pathogens, evaluating efficacy of ectoparasiticide products, investigating transmission dynamics and control strategies for bovine anaplasmosis and threlliosis, examining tick-borne pathogen prevalence, and tick-borne pathogen vaccine development. Dr. Reif enjoys engaging veterinarians and clients and producers in research projects and developing and delivering presentations on the importance of ticks and tick-borne pathogens to clinicians and the general public. Join more than 100,000 learners just like you. Vetfolio is one of the largest providers of continuing education for the animal health community, offering more than 500 race-approved CE courses. Earn veterinary CE anytime, anywhere with Vetfolio. Subscribe today at vetfolio.com. I'm joined by Dr. Katherine Reif, and we're going to talk in this episode about speed of kill. And Dr. Reif, I'm so glad that that we're talking about this. This is something I feel like I'm constantly trying to figure out with tick prevention. We see so much tick-borne disease here in Florida, and I don't think it's limited to the Southeast by any means. Um, so thank you for joining me to kind of shed some light on on this that can be a little bit hard to figure out. My pleasure. Very happy to be here. Yes. And I understand this is, this is a big topic. You have, you know, a study that talks about speed of kill. And I know for me personally, when I've read through the labels of some of the common tick preventatives, it's, you know, it's often labeled as killing ticks within 48 hours or killing ticks within 72 hours, but not necessarily like how fast those ticks are dying. Um, So where, where is the, that 48 hour, that 72 hour label coming from? Sure. So when a company seeks to get a, a claim to include a tick species on, on their label, uh, they pretty much have to think about how the pharmacokinetics of their individual drug molecules work and how quickly they're going to continue to work over the entire dosing period, whether it's a monthly product or an extended duration product. So then they have to pick a particular time frame. And like I said, it's it's typically based on the pharmacokinetics and maybe how similar molecules also act. And then they do a defined study for that particular time point. And most studies are done to see what percentage of ticks are killed 
by 48 hours or 72 hours. And the target that they're looking to to hit is 90% or greater of ticks being controlled within those respective timeframes. If they wanted to do a whole series of earlier time points, then they would need essentially a new group of dogs for every treatment group and untreated controls to get a label claim for earlier, earlier time points. So they're kind of not necessarily restricted, but practically you choose one time point, you see if you can achieve that 90% threshold because you need to be able to do it for the entire duration of that product's dosing span. Okay, that makes sense. So if I'm hearing you correctly, they they pick that time frame and not only do we want to see these ticks killed within, let's say, a 48-hour period, if that's the time point that's chosen, but we want to see that when the, that product is first administered, and we want to know that that's still happening at the end of the dosing range. Correct. Yes. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. And and why we see those labels written the way that we do, um, kind of talking about ticks and why it's so important that these products are working through the their whole duration of, of their label. I, I feel like we're, we're remiss if we don't touch on seasonality. I think, you know, there's a lot of misperception, which I, I think is becoming clearer and clearer to, to us in the veterinary field. Um, but I always, you know, I, I've talked to you about this before, and I think you do such a great job of kind of explaining the seasonality or really lack lack of seasonality when it comes to ticks. So can you can you talk about seasonality a little bit? Sure. So it, it, it would be very difficult to find any place in really the continental U.S. where there's not some tick species that's active at, at, at every month of, of the year. Even in our more northern climate states where we have, you know, good cold snaps and, and frosts, there are times in our traditional winter months December, January, February, where it does warm up sufficiently that ticks can become active again. So there's certainly times of the year where they're more active and and that's going to be based on what tick species are most common in in a given area. And and that will differ based on where people are are located, but pretty much in, in every part of the continental U.S. and Hawaii, and the exception here could possibly be Alaska, we, we, we would find, we would have the capabilities of finding or, or the likelihood of, of finding some tick species active. Um, we have our more warm weather other loving ticks, that would be like our Lone Star ticks, our American dog ticks. Uh, Brown dog ticks really have no seasonality. That's because they like to infest homes and kennels. So we tend to like to live in climate controlled areas and so do they. So really no seasonality with them. But then we have other species like our Exodi species, our black-legged ticks, our deer ticks, and the adult life stages of that. those species are cold or cool weather loving ticks. So it's very likely and we can find it pretty easily. Individuals popping up in those traditional winter months. My general rule of thumb is if it's greater than 35 degrees, if it's warmer than 35 degrees Fahrenheit outside, it based on temperature alone is sufficiently warm enough for tick species to be active. And what I like to challenge people to do, and I oftentimes include it in my TikTok presentations, is I make a a figure, a calendar figure of the area where I'm presenting at. And I look back at the historical temperature from the previous year and circle dates in in red where the temperature high was greater than 35 degrees Fahrenheit, indicating, you know, it's warm enough for ticks to be active and circle dates in blue where the temperature high is below 35 degrees Fahrenheit, indicating unlikely for ticks to be active. And you may be in Detroit, you may be in somewhere in Maine, maybe Portland, Maine, uh, up in Minnesota. And there's dates that are circled in red in those traditional winter months. So we really do live in a place where ticks pose a risk to not only our pets, but ourselves year round. Absolutely. So we need to make sure that that these pets are on prevention 12 months out of the year. And like we talked about before, that that prevention is working throughout the duration of of that range that it's it's labeled to work for because yes. it's going to be very rare that we would find unless like you said we're up in Alaska we'd find yeah. you know an extended length of time without ticks being active right well let's talk distribution a little bit i live in a really rural area and i went for a walk the other day with my dog and i came back and sure enough there were some some lone star ticks that made their way back with me so i had to go get rid of those guys 
So I know certainly in Florida, a lot of Lone Star ticks, but in general, like, can you, can you touch on tick distribution? And I know, you know, Lone Stars are particularly concerning. So maybe with like an kind of an emphasis on, on the Lone Star tick distribution. Sure. Absolutely. I guess to start off with, I'll, I'll say that most of our medically important tick species are are on the move. Their populations in general are expanding. So it, the tick situation is for a given area 15 years ago, 10 years ago, maybe even five years ago, isn't necessarily the same tick situation for that area. So we always need to kind of keep abreast of, of what is current for, for our area when it comes to tick species, because that'll inform what tick-borne pathogens are, are present. One of these tick species is this lone star tick. Traditionally, we have the densest population of this tick species in the southeast part of the U.S., but we're starting to see, we've, we've been seeing actually, a uh, rapid expansion northward in the eastern half of the U.S., and we're also starting to see expansion westward. Uh, what's interesting, maybe terrifying too, is that as these lone tick populations are moving into areas where maybe they shouldn't necessarily be able to live, they're also genetically diverse diversifying, uh, which could have implications when it comes to pathogen transmission, for example. Uh, but with regard to Lone Star tick populations, we now find it uh, we now find them really commonly throughout the eastern coastal region in the southern parts of our more northern Midwestern states. And we can find them pockets of them even as far north as as in Maine. Uh, so they are they are tick species on the move, and they certainly carry with them a variety of different disease causing agents that are really relevant to both animal health and and human health as well. Goodness sakes. It's that's like, you know, we we know that that that's what's happening. We're seeing expansion of you know, a number of infectious parasites, diseases, things like that. But it's always, like you said, a little terrifying to hear just the degree of expansion that we're seeing. Yeah. And I think I'd like to add as uh, resources that people can kind of look towards if they want to see what the, the situation regarding ticks are in their area. Um, the CDC has updated a lot of their tick maps and, and surveillance. So the cdc.gov, I think backslash ticks, they have a really nice tick maps at a general scale that can be downloaded. Uh, and then we have a wonderful resource in the Companion Animal Parasite Council maps. And it's not that they're mapping ticks per se, but they map that and, and we can infer uh, where ticks are based on where our pets are coming up positive for certain tick-borne agents. An example of that are Ehrlichia species, which are commonly transmitted by Lone Star ticks. And if we look at the forecast maps that CAPC puts out year over year, we can see kind of our zone of Ehrlichia moving further and further north, uh, indicating that that our Lone Star tick population is also moving further and further north because that's how the diseases, the pathogens get there. Oh my goodness. And I love that you you listed those resources because those can be helpful just for our own knowledge, but also when we're talking to clients about the importance of tick prevention. And, you know, along those lines, I think we've probably covered a lot of this and what we've talked about so far, but just to kind of, you know, bring it to a head, put a point on it. Can you remind us why it's so important to make sure that we're keeping pets on tick prevention and why it's so important to continue to have these conversations with owners? Sure. So ticks, they, they, they pose a risk to our pets. They pose a risk in and of themselves without pathogen transmission. Sometimes our pets can get so inundated that they may experience severe anemia. Other ticks can induce a state of uh, potential paralysis in, in pets or, or people. We have our new alpha-gal syndrome or red meat allergy. That's associated with the lone star tick. So another thing to be concerned about when we have, when we have lone star ticks, but certainly they're phenomenal vectors of pathogens too. And a lot of these pathogens are zoonotic. So that means they can infect our pets as well as they can infect us as well. So if we have our family dog that's testing positive for Ehrlichia, that means that that dog has been in an area with infected ticks because that's how it gets Ehrlichia. Um, how does our dog get there? Well, it probably either lives in that area or with, with infected ticks or it's visited an area with infected ticks. And that probably means means that we've also live in we also live in that area or have visited that area too because we hang out with our pets and we have a lot of same risk factors as our pets for coming across ticks and potentially 
getting a tick-borne disease through a tick bite. So our pets are really good sentinels for our own risk. And if we're doing a good job kind of keeping abreast of their tick situation and vector-borne screening annually, that gives us an, a good idea of, of kind of our own risk as well. Absolutely. It always, you know, I always struggle to have that conversation when I have a pet owner who's like, you know, I might like pull a tick off of them maybe, you know, a couple times a year, but in general, like, I don't think ticks are a big concern. And it's like so hard sometimes to hold it in and not be like, you don't understand if you're pulling ticks off of them, they're there and we're all at risk if that's happening. Yeah. And a lot of times ticks, you know, ticks are very stealthy critters. Like they want to go unnoticed, but they, they're, a lot of times we don't feel them crawling on us. It's really hard to find them in in uh, the the coats of our pets, even if maybe they don't have they don't even have to have really dense coats. It's it still can be difficult to do a, a true full body search and for for a tick check. And then when when they're actually biting our pets or ourselves, they're secreting, they're salivating all of these fancy proteins that basically help them hide from the host's immune system. So a lot of times people expect a pet to be itchy when they're infested with ticks and they're not itchy. And that's the special tick spit that it that the tick is producing to mask their their presence from the host's immune system. So we know that ticks largely go unnoticed. Um, but if you're finding one, I guarantee that they're more regularly exposed than than that pet owner truly believes or thinks that they are. Absolutely. And you talked about the tick paralysis earlier. I feel like certainly this applies to me and I feel like anyone who's ever gone on a tick hunt for a dog with tick paralysis can appreciate how hard they are to find sometimes. I mean, it can take, they can hide in the, you know, down in the ears and all kinds of weird things that can happen. And, and it can get, it can get really scary. Cause I'm, I'm thinking of an experience I had where we really struggled to find the tick and it was looking like this wasn't tick paralysis and there was something else neurologically very wrong with this dog. And we were like, you know, do we have to put her down? What's going to happen? And it was like at the 11th hour, we found this tick and, and the dog got better, but it was, I mean, we searched that dog over and over and over again. She did have a thick coat, but still like they're hard to find. Yeah. So what we're talking about here, or one of the big focuses where we started was speed of kill. And you know, we talked about the 48 hour and the 72 hour label claim and why those are there, but kind of pivoting back to why speed of kill is so important. How fast are some of the more common tick diseases transmitted? I understand it's, it's pretty fast. Yeah, so we don't have a, a ton of studies out there looking at speed of kill for, or I'm sorry, not, not speed of kill, transmission timing for a lot of our common tick species. We certainly have the most studies when it comes to Borrelia burgdorferi, the agent of Lyme disease. And cumulatively looking over the, the body of literature that we have available for us, it looks like Borrelia burgdorferi is transmitted not too much earlier than about 24 hours after a host is is infested. You know, those are experimental studies that have been performed. So in the lab, so we always need to think about these things kind of as a window, right? Because in nature, things may be different, but it, it's, it's probably unlikely to happen too much earlier than that normally. Uh, but the longer that tick is on that host feeding, the more the pathogen is replicating in the tick. And so more opportunity for the pathogen to be transmitted via the saliva of the tick into the host that it's feeding on. So that's Borrelia, but some of our rickettsial agents may be transmitted even a little bit more quickly. And we have fewer studies on, on these. So Anaplasma phagus vitophilum, the agent of anaplasmosis for pets and people, there, there's, there's a, a report that suggests that it may be transmitted, start to be transmitted as early as somewhere between 16 and, and 24 hours. Um, and this is based on just a, a single study that was performed a, a while ago. So there's a potential that it could be transmitted a, a little bit earlier than the Lyme disease agent. Although again, the longer that tick is on that host, the more the pathogen is replicating in the tick, the more likely it's gonna be transmitted via the saliva. So there's been no transmission timing studies with U.S. strains of Ehrlichia and Lone Star ticks or U.S. strains of Ehrlichia and brown dog ticks. But there have been some European studies done with Ehrlichia canis and the brown dog tick. And 
in those studies, they were able to demonstrate transmission as soon as three hours. So that is a really alarmingly fast transmission time. But I do want to just put a word of caution out there that we don't have domestic studies that support that transmission time. And that's brown dog tick. If we think about our lone star tick ehrlichias, which are going to be our most common ehrlichias, we, we don't have studies that have specifically addressed that. But they are probably likely to be on the order of anaplasma uh, transmission timing, if not more quick. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So some of these, you know, really fast and gosh, ehrlichia, like one would hope it's not three hours, but I, I've heard similar from the European studies that it could potentially be very fast. And even like 16 to 24 hours, I mean, is fairly quick to transmit that because we don't always find those ticks right away. Like if your dog picks one up and, you know, when he goes outside at night for, for a walk or something, and then you, you know, sits there overnight, you're starting to get into that time frame pretty, pretty easily. Yeah. So we want to start, we, we really want our tick control products to start incapacitating ticks quickly and, and killing them quickly as, as well to prevent that. Yes. Which brings us to your study. Can you tell us more about it? What did it show with regard to speed of kill in ticks with some of the more common tick control products that we might be familiar with? So when I was at K-State still at the beginning of 2023, uh, we did a study that was sponsored by Alenco where we wanted to compare the tick speed of kill for three monthly dose tick control products. And, and those products were Credelio. And so the active ISOX in that product is Lotolaner. And then Trio, the active ISOX product in that or molecule in that is Seralaner. And then NextGuard with the active ISOX of a Fox laner. So all of these different laners, Lotolaner, Seralaner, a Fox laner, they're all in they're all in the same drug class of the ISOX azolines. And we wanted to see how quickly pets or, or dogs treated with a single dose of one of these monthly products had their ticks controlled. So we wanted to see how quickly these products were working at the beginning of treatment to control an existing tick infestation. And then we wanted to see, you know, are they working as quickly in the second half of the month to control new infestations that a, a dog may be challenged with uh, at 21 days post treatment and then again at 28 days post treatment. So right there at the tail end of that, these products dosing lifespans or lab labeled lifespans. And the tick that we chose for our study was the Lone Star tick, Amblyoma americanum. And choosing that tick is, you know, no light choice, I, I would say. Uh, it's a really challenging tick to kill and, and that's reflected on a lot of product labels. And so we wanted a really robust challenge for, for our study to evaluate the efficacy of, of these three products. So we enrolled dogs in, in, in the study. We pre-infested them with Lone Star ticks two days before treatment. And then on day zero, they were treated with their group's respective tick control product. So either, again, Credelio, Sempericatrio, or Nexgard. Um, and then we we evaluated their tick infection or infestation levels at 4, 8, 12, 24, 48, and 72 hours post-treatment to really get an idea of how quickly these products were working to, to control or to treat an existing Lone Star tick infestation. We found in general that the products collectively worked pretty similarly to each other to control an existing tick infestation. In our study, Semperica Trio was a little bit slower than the other two products, but in general, they they work reasonably comparably. But when we reinfested these dogs in the second half of the month at day 21 and 28, now we're doing our tick counts at 4, 8, 12, 24, 48, and 72 hours post infestation, this is where we really start started to see a, a difference in terms of the speed with which these products controlled new infestations. And we had our Credelio product that was uh, still treating or, or controlling new infestations by over 90% within 24 hours post-infestation at day 21 or 28. And our other two products, there was there was a lag in, in the time with which they controlled a similar percentage of ticks. So at the 21 day mark, when these dogs were reinfested, Delio, as I mentioned, controlled over 90% of ticks by 
uh, 24 hours. It took some paracatrio out to 48 hours to control 90% or more of ticks and the next guard out to 72 hours to control 90% or greater of ticks. And then at the very end of the month, when our dogs were reinfested for the last time, Cordelio is still controlled over 90% by 24 hours post infestation. And our other two products took 72 hours or longer to control a, a similar percentage of ticks. Um, so we could say from this study that Laudelaner, the active isoxazoline in Cordelio, was doing a really nice job rapidly killing ticks throughout with a sustained speed of activity throughout that product's dosing activity. And that's really reflected at the end of the month. It's it's killing Lone Star ticks, this really robust challenge uh, species, two days earlier than the other products evaluated in this study. So when we think about pathogen transmission timing, and, and we spoke about the fact that Borrelias maybe start to be transmitted at 24 hours post-infestation, anaplasma maybe a little bit quicker than than that, and Ehrlichia maybe even scary faster than, than that, but we just don't know so much in, in the U.S. context. And we think about how quickly these products are 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 number one labeled to to kill ticks, and that can be 48 hours, 72 hours, so a day or two after maybe pathogen transmission has the potential to, to start. We want these products to, to be killing ticks as quickly as possible. And so we saw from our dogs treated with Cordelio, the active isox in that product being Laudelaner, that it maintained a good, quick, a caricidal tick killing activity as, as quick the end of its dosing period as it did at the beginning of its dosing period. So it's working to kill ticks still within this 24-hour mark uh, where the other products that were evaluated in the study uh, took at, at the very end of the dosing period, maybe two days, out, out, to, out to two days longer to kill ticks. And so when we think about pathogen transmission timing, we know that they're potentially being transmitted earlier than the, these 72-hour marks, which is common on the label of these tick control products. So if we have products that can kill these Lone Star ticks faster, uh, and especially because they're a really challenging tick to kill, you know that that is an ideal situation, uh, especially if it's our our primary tick of concern for the area. In, in, in which we live, or maybe our, our pet is visiting over the course of its year. Absolutely. And that's a, that's a really significant difference. Any hypothesis as to why Cordelio continued to work so much longer than the other products? So this is just a hypothesis, but I'm, I'm guessing it has to do with the half-life of, of that product. It has a much longer half-life by like almost a half-life that's twice as long as the other two isoxazoline drugs products. So the half-life of a Cordelio is about 30 days versus about 12 to 13 days for the other two products. So that probably contributes to the fact it's sustained for a longer period of time. I had no idea that there was such a difference in half-life between all the molecules or among all the molecules. Interesting. Interesting. Well, Dr. Wraith, as usual, you have done a fantastic job of really illustrating the importance of keeping, you know, ticks, tick-borne diseases, tick prevention top of mind. Kind of to summarize all of it, what does all of this information mean for us as veterinary professionals when we're making preventative care recommendations for pet owners? Sure. So I think the most important thing is number one, having a good idea of what tick species are are common to the region or the area that the pet is living and or visiting during the course of each year as a veterinarian is kind of reviewing what an appropriate parasite control plan is for, for that patient. Um, if Lone Star ticks are a tick that's dominant in, in the area, I would really consider the the labels of the products that are are being considered as a recommendation you know i definitely want to see a lone star tick on there pretty much if you see a lone star tick on on a label you should have confidence that that product is is a robust product but Based on our study, we know that there is nuanced differences in terms of how quickly these different molecules or drugs in these in these common monthly dose tick control products are working to to kill ticks, especially Lone Star ticks. And there's quite quite a difference. So if 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 I personally lived in a Lone Star endemic area, I would I would want to choose a tick control product that 
like kill these ticks as as quickly as as possible. I want them dead on my pet before they have an opportunity to potentially get off my pet and and get onto me. But you know, even just for my and really top of top of mind just for my pet's health as well. Like I, I want them to be protected and choosing a product that can rapidly kill ticks is is one way that I can help ensure their health and reduce their risk of uh, potentially developing a tick-borne disease. Absolutely. Making recommendations that, you know, are really in the best interest of our pets and their health. But when it comes to tick prevention, that also, you know, that also has implications, like you said, on our health and our well-being. So yeah. making these recommendations and continuing to have these conversations with pet owners, as frustrating as it can be sometimes, is it, I think, you know, like I said, as, as always, you've done such a good job of reminding us and really illustrating why it's so important. So thank you so much for for joining me and for discussing this study. It sounds like, you know, it's kind of kind of groundbreaking and unique and really interesting, great information that we need to have. Um, so, you know, as we wrap up here, are there any final thoughts you want to share with us? No, I think we should all do our best to keep aware of, of t- what ticks are in our area. And we have lots of resources to, to help us identify these risks. And, and remember as well, our, our pets and us are at risk of different tick species if we if we travel or visit other places. Uh, so we need to keep that in mind when making recommendations or thinking of best practices to prevent ticks coming on our, our pets and ourselves. Absolutely. Well, thank you again for joining me. It's always a pleasure to, to have these conversations. I always love hearing all, all of this information. So really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks. Happy to be here. So I thought this was really interesting because I have certainly been known to nerd out on some of the labels of some of the common products, some of which we've talked about here, and look at the label claims. And it has like raised a lot of questions with me as far as, you know, where do these label claims come from? What exactly do they mean? So this talk really cleared up a lot of questions for me and I thought just had some great information in it. So hopefully everybody else feels the same way. Huge thank you to Elenco for sponsoring this episode. Thank you, Dr. Reif, for taking the time to join us. I know it was it was crunch time in between trips and I really appreciate you finding a window here. And I really appreciate you taking the time. For those of you out there listening, thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts. It'll help other veterinary professionals like you find this and other great content we try to put out there. For more episodes like this, click on the Education tab on the Vetfolio website. As always, we'd love to hear your input on this talk, as well as ideas for topics you'd like to hear from us in the future. Feel free to reach out to me at dvm at vetfolio.com. You can also visit my Facebook page at Dr. Cassie DVM, and you can find me on LinkedIn. And remember, if one animal is better off because of you today, it's a great day. Mm